All right, so Genesis chapter number 16. Let's start, look down there at verse number 1 again. We always read the entire chapter. We go through this verse by verse. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. Now don't forget, up to this point, Abram has already been promised to have seed that it's like the stars of heaven. God's already made this promise unto him. He says, you know, you had him walk through the promised land and see, see all this land? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to your seed. God has made the promise unto Abram. And last week we saw um, in Genesis chapter 15 is, is where it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But we saw in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians chapter 3 and also in James chapter 2 is a reference in all three of those places and we looked at all of those places so this is after that I mean Abraham is all he's believed God he's been given these promises he knows he's supposed to, to have an heir and you know a son because at the time he, he didn't have any children then either he was just like look you know this servant he's my he's like my son he's gonna inherit everything because I don't have any children God he's like that's what I want from you please bless me with children and God answers his prayer he says I will do that for you he tells him that. Now, he didn't give it to him right away, but he says, you will have seed. You know, look up to the stars. If you could count them, you know, that's how many children you're going to have. So as we're reading here, keep that in mind because it reiterates, you know, Sarai didn't have any children, but she had this handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Verse number two, And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Sarai. Now, what I want to point out here is that, you know, obviously this is, this is extremely wicked. This is wickedness found not only in Sarai, but in Abram also. Sarai wants to have children. She wa she's already had it, you know, like, probably worked up in her mind. God's, you know, promised them they're going to have kids. She wants to have a child. And she's thinking by this point, because she's old as well. Abram, it says, was um, 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Okay. So at this time, he's probably around 85 when they concoct this plan. Right. And Sarah is about 10 years younger than Abram. So she's like 75. So she's thinking, you know, I'm 75 years old. Maybe we should have children through my handmaid. You no, know, you you could go in under her, and that will be like like she would just have that child because that's her maid, and the child wouldn't belong in her. Just basically, she would raise that child as her own, and that alone is wicked. I mean, what's interesting to me though about this because Abraham hearkened unto her voice then too, so they're both obviously complicit in this sin. They're both, you know, Sarah gets this idea, Abraham goes along right with it. He should have just stopped right there and be like, no, we're not going to do that. God promised us to have children and he didn't mean to do it this way. But he was complicit. He did it. But what's interesting is what Sarah said. Because this is not common knowledge these days. This is not common belief among Baptists, among Christians. She said, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. And that's an absolutely true statement. And we find this, this truth all throughout the Bible that God is the one that opens and closes the womb. And this is serious today because most people just completely forget about God when it comes to having children. When it comes to planning, how many children are we going to have? When are we going to have children? And they think that it's up to them. You know, Christians, they think that I'm going to decide, well, I'm going to get married when I'm 20 or 22 when I get out of college, and then we're going to go and we're going to, you know, get our jobs and we're both going to work, and then we're going to build up this money, and then we're going to go out and, and, you know, travel the world, and then we're going to come back, and then we're going to start a family, and then we're going to do, you know, and, and they just get this whole plan planned out when that is completely against what God's plan is for having a family, for having children, for any of this stuff. And I'm, we're going to go through a bunch of scriptural references to this because ultimately God's the one that gives life, God's the one that opens the womb, and God's the one that closes the womb. And it's not up to us to decide when that's going to happen and when it's not. And Abram and Sarah's wife, you know, because people say, oh, well, if you don't do anything about it, then you're just going to have like 50 kids. That's not the case here. Abram and Sarah didn't, I mean, they had zero children all the way up until Abram was like 100 years old. That's when I, I mean, if, you, if you're going to, except for this instance, when, when he went outside of marriage and they tried to, tried to do thing and things another way, 
he was 100 years old when God blessed him with Isaac, which was the son of promise. And you think of Isaac and Rebekah too. They went, I mean, he prayed for 20 years, 20 years before God opened up the womb and they had two children, Jacob and Esau. And that's it. Now, I don't think they were doing, using any devices and all this other stuff. To do with they wanted to have children. And the general attitude is that children are a blessing from the Lord. And the Bible actually teaches that. Go ahead and turn, if you would, to... Um, well, I'm going I'm to go out of order my notes. That's fine. Turn to Psalm 127. Turn to Psalm 127. We need to get back to this understanding that God is the one that opens and closes the womb and that if we want to have any say in the matter, that we need to go to God and pray to God, either if you want, you know, whether you want children or not, talk to the Lord about it because He's the one that opens and closes the womb. We have a lot of Christians that don't want to follow God's plan and let God decide how many children you ought to have and when you ought to have them. Instead, they want to plan everything out and in a way play God and determine that for themselves. When they don't want children, you know, they oftentimes will get on birth control. Now, one of the biggest, the most popular method of birth control is the pill for women, right? And supposedly, it's supposed to prevent the egg from ever producing so that there's nothing to, to um, conceive for it to have a child. But that's not the only means in that medication, in that, in, that, in that pill. It also makes the womb of a, a, a hostile environment for any type, for, if conception were to happen, for that child to implant into the wall, you know, all, all the science behind it. Basically what ends up happening when you take these birth control pills is there's silent abortions. The reason why they're called silent abortions is because you don't even realize that it happened. Because of all of the effects of the pill, that's the way they're able to get their 99% effectiveness of preventing pregnancy is because it's not just that it's, it's completely fully functioning of being able to restrain an egg from ever being produced. It's also creating this hostile environment. And I didn't get the statistics for uh, this sermon, but they're pretty high. If you have a normal relationship with your wife and the, your wife is, is taking that, you know, the pill to prevent you from having children, you are having probably a couple of silent abortions throughout the year without even realizing it. And hopefully I don't have to preach that life begins at conception. And when the woman conceives seed, the Bible is very clear that that is a child. That's called being with child. And when you are doing things to your body, to prevent that child from growing, you're, you're murdering that child. And, and it's a very serious thing. And most people do this ignorantly. You know, most people, if, especially Christians, if you knew that this was the case, you probably wouldn't do it. If you were able to be confronted with the facts, and we have the facts, and actually, you know what? We have them right here. If you're interested about this, if you don't know the information, we've got the DVD right here. One of them, and, and it's all on the internet anyways. Go find it for yourself. The truth about birth control. This lays out the science, the facts, the data that you can, you can see for yourself um, that taking these types of, of birth control will actually cause your child to die. And it's not something any Christian should be a part of. But that's what, what people want to do. They want to be able to control when they have children. And inadvertently, in most cases, they don't even realize they're killing children. And then they decide after, after it's whatever goes on, they say, well, now we want to have children. Well, the other, th the other bad aspect about taking that stuff is that you've now trained your body to be a hostile environment for having children. And typically, it takes you just about as long to get your body back to a normal reproductive environment. Um, for as long as you've been taking the pill, it's going to take you about that long to get, to get back to normal, to be able to... to um, to have a, a good environment for a child to grow. And that's why there's so many miscarriages then after someone just gets off the pill. And this is what happens when we start to get involved in things that really is not our job and not our place to be getting involved with. But let's turn to some scripture. I want, I want to prove to you tonight, that's, that's a little bit of science of what actually happens when you go that route. 
Okay, and you can look up the statistics for yourself. It's all available online. It's a fact. Okay, it's a fact. There's, it's irrefutable that silent abortions happen when women are on the pill and you're having a normal rela relationship with your husband. But you're in Psalm 127. We need to get this concept back, first of all, that children are a good thing. Children are a blessing. Psalm 127, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Does that sound like a good thing or a bad thing? The fruit of the womb is His reward. That's a good thing. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. This is how the Bible describes having children. Hey, if you've got your quiver, you know, it's relating them to arrows, your children as arrows. You've got a, a quiver full of arrows. If you have a, a household full of children, he says, happy is the man. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak to the enemies with the enemies in the gate. And he says, so are the children of the youth. So is he saying you ought to wait and get settled and make sure you're financially stable and do all these other things before you ever start having children? He says, no. He says, children of the youth. Live out your life. If you know, first of all, let's just go. Let's go through God's plan. Instead of instead of worrying about what the world's plan is, because you get all kinds of different answers, anyways. God's plan is if you're not married first and foremost, then you shouldn't be having any children. That's out of the question. You have a relationship with someone outside of marriage. It's called fornication. It's a wicked sin and ought not to be done. This is God's perfect plan for your life. You're not married, no children, no fornication, nothing like that. So you don't have to deal with that. Okay, now if you are married, because there's, mo there's multiple ways people can choose to not have children. One of them says, okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to take any drugs or use any devices because I don't really believe in that. So you say, but we're, we're, we just will abstain from having a relationship. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, because... That's one way, right? That's one way to, to make sure you're not going to have any children is just to completely abstain from having a physical relationship with your spouse. But we'll see if that is what God intended either. Does that line up with, with what the Bible says about how a husband and wife <clears throat> should be in a marriage? 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So first of all, he's saying, look, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. He's talking to people who are not married, right? You're single. It's good for you not to touch a woman. He says, but to avoid fornication, avoid having that physical relationship outside of marriage, have a wife, get married, do that. So one of the purposes even for getting married I'm not saying this is the only purpose, but one of the purposes for, for getting married is so that you don't commit this sin of fornication. So that you can engage in this type of physical relationship and it's completely fine and within God's parameters. That's one of the reasons for, for, for marriage anyways. But let's keep reading. He says, verse number three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now, this may sh sound shocking to the world today because we grow up in a society that says, you know, like no means no, and you have to have consensual relations and stuff like that. Now, obviously, ideally, you should have consensual relationships, but what the Bible is teaching here is saying, look, you don't really have control over your own body, your spouse does. And, and it goes both directions, not like only the man controls the wife. No. Hey, the wife has power over your body, man, too. So when, whenever either person wants to have that relationship, he's saying, you don't have control over that. It's up to them. Because it, there's, <laughs> we, we have these desires, and part of marriage is to, is, is to be able to, to have that relationship and will prevent people from seeking that relationship outside of their marriage. And um, let, let's keep reading here, verse number five, because this will wrap up this, this uh, portion of Scripture. He explains it even further. He says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So 
what the Bible is saying here is that in order to not have that relationship, there needs to be consent from both parties. Not to have the relationship. He said that to not have that physical relationship, there needs to be consent. And it, but it's only for a time. Look at what it says. That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So who here, and, you know, I, I don't want to... Who here has ever fasted for longer than like three days? Because I haven't. Longer, longer than seven days. One person has fasted longer than three days, but less than seven days. So the purpose for not having that physical relationship with your spouse, it says with consent, so that you can give yourself to prayer and fasting. Now, obviously, when you fast, you are withholding. It's not, you, it's not just food. I mean, you are afflicting your soul. You are withholding food, oftentimes water, and just, just anything that's kind of like pleasurable. What you're doing is you're afflicting yourself while you're praying to God and really earnestly praying and fervently praying to God for Him to answer your prayers. So withholding that, that type of relationship with your spouse makes sense to do that when you're praying and fasting. But the time that that goes on without, without, uh, without having that, if it's for prayer and fasting, I mean, no one in here has ever fasted for seven days. <laughs> right? And, and even three days is a long time. Most, most people, when they fast, and my fasts have been like a day. That's typically whenever I do is just a day, you know. Um, but, you know, you can do a day, three days, whatever. Um, I'm not going to preach all about fasting. The point is, that is the, the, the reason that the Bible outlines for not having that relationship. God, you know, if you're married, you should be having this relationship because what's going to happen is it's going to keep you from being tempted. That's why he says that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. This is a lot of the reason why there's so much adultery today. There's, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is because People aren't having this relationship that they ought to be having, a physical relationship with one another. When you're having that relationship, I mean, it keeps you together. It keeps you close. It keeps you real close. But, it's, but you're going to you know, love your spouse a lot more when you're, when you're engaging in that type of relationship. And when one of you is withholding that from the other, obviously that's not scriptural. But if you're just saying, nope, don't want it, nope, got a headache, nope, whatever, you know, I'm tired, and did all the different excuses you have, I don't want to have the relationship, it, it can lead to your spouse trying to seek that pleasure, that, that type of relationship outside of marriage. And that's wicked also. That's not justification. But look, if we want to have a good marriage, if we want to do everything possible, make sure that, that we're going to have a great marriage, we're going to do things according to the Bible, let's look at what the Bible says about how we should have our marriage. Now, if you're having that type of relationship, obviously children are going to come along with that. And that's why it's so important to have the proper view of children. Children, are they a lot of work? Yeah, you bet they're a lot of work. Of course they are. Especially if you want to do it right. Now, if you want to just go ahead and dump them off and let someone else take care of them and, you know, hire people to do all these jobs for you, it might be a little bit easier. But if you're going to do a right job, if you're going to raise them appropriately, you got to be watching them. you got to be making sure they're not getting into trouble. you got to be disciplining them. you got to be teaching them and training them. And do that's a lot of work. And that's one of the main reasons, I think, why people don't want to have children. They say, well, it's too much work. Or they'll think, well, we can't afford it. We don't have enough money. Now, look, God has promised to take care of you. If God wants you to have this relationship with your wife, as we already saw, and turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 2. If God wants you to have this type of relationship, He knows what's going to happen as a result. God's the one that, that opens and closes the womb. Do you think God's going to give you something that you can't handle? Do you think God's going to give you something that, oh, yeah, now you're going to be homeless and poor and not be able to feed yourselves because God has given you children? I don't believe that for a second. I've got a lot more faith than that, that God will feed us God will, he's he's promised to do it he's promised to promise to feed us and clothe us and if we're obeying his commands if we're doing things the right way if we have a righteous relationship if we if we have a spouse we're married we're doing everything the right way God will take care of us we need to be able to just trust him that he'll do that and have the proper view of children that they're a blessing I don't know about you but 
I love my kids tremendously. You know, they're young. And yes, they're a lot of work. But they provide so much hap excuse me, happiness and joy and are a true blessing. And as they get older, they're going to continue to be a blessing. They're going to be able to help out more and do certain things around the house. And, and does it require a lot of work? Yes. But it truly is a blessing from God. And, and we need to have this right type of mindset. They, they did back then. Genesis 24, I know you're in Genesis chapter 2, but in Genesis 24, 60, when, when um, Isaac's servant went out to find, well, Abraham's servant went out to find a wife for, for Isaac, and he found Rebekah, and, and she agreed to go and to be Isaac's wife, this is what they said unto her. This is how they blessed her, because they blessed her as she left. In Genesis 24, verse 60, they, it says, And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother, get this, of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. That's a blessing. You say thousands of millions. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> now, obviously, you can't do that in one lifetime. But, but the point is, this is the best way that they could think of for her to be blessed is to have a lot of children. See, we, we pray that God will just bless you with a lot of children. That would be an incredible blessing for you to have. That's what they blessed her with as she left. And children are inherited to the Lord. We saw that in Psalm 127. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Because even when God made Adam and Eve, you know, Eve's name was called Eve because she's the mother of all living. That's part of her role. It's part of her function as being a mother. That's what her name was tied up in being and having children. But look at verse 24. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, notice it doesn't say that leave your father and mother, go to college, finish that, get a job, and then cleave to your wife and become one flesh. It says, no, you leave your father and mother when you get married, and then you become one flesh. You don't wait on it. You don't, you don't do other things first. When you get married, you're joining yourselves together. And the natural result of that is having children. The only example, turn if you would, you're in Genesis 2, just flip over to Genesis 38. Because there is one example in the Bible. We ought to be able to go to the Bible for all of our decision making, any of the important things. Deciding whether or not to have children is an important life decision. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, probably one of the biggest decisions you can make, getting married, you know, th th there's a few things that are critical decisions. Having children. Let's use Scripture to understand, to make that decision, to, to, to get wisdom. How should, we, how should we decide this? And what we see in the Bible, all, you can read the entire Bible from cover to cover. You will not find an example of anyone using birth control except in this story that we're going to look at right here. And it's found in Genesis 38. This is the only example. So this, if God wants to tell us anything about using birth control, I think we're going to find it right here. Genesis chapter, we already saw the verses about children being a blessing, okay? So you could already deduce from that, well, if they're a blessing, if it's a good thing, we probably shouldn't prevent it from happening, right? But let's look at Genesis 38. Look at verse number 8. This is Judah's children. He had Ur and Onan. Well, look at verse 7. It says, And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. Now, this is something that was ought to be done um, according to God's law. When, when um, a woman was married to a man, and, she, and her husband died, and she was childless, then it was the brother's duty to go in and be her husband, and then when they had children, the firstborn would be raised up as seed to the deceased, to the brother, to raise up a name so he could keep a name within Israel, you know, and have their possession and things like that. That was his duty. Now, it wasn't forced. They didn't have to do that. They could still deny that and not marry or whatever, but that was what they were supposed to do. And so here's what he does. You know, his, his brother dies, so it says, um, Judah said, okay, you know, take her to be your wife, do your duty, Raise up seed to your brother, verse number 9. And, known, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife 
that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. And a lot of people take it and say, oh yeah, well God was just mad though because his sin was not wanting to raise up seed to his brother, but it doesn't matter what the reason is. People have all kinds of reasons not to have children. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Now, if he didn't want to do that, he could have just said, I'm not going to marry her, right? It seems to me like he wanted to have that relationship. He just didn't want the result of it. Which is the vast majority of the reason why people are, that's the only reason, I mean, that's the reason why people use birth control today, right? When, when he marries, because I want to have this relationship and I don't want the outcome. That displeased the Lord and God killed, killed Onan. That's a steep punishment. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty severe. Say, you're dead. That's how God felt, felt about that. I don't think God's opinion has changed about using birth control today. This, and this is the only example we have. I mean, you could, you could look through it, but this is one example where, where something was done to prevent childbirth on purpose and God killed Onan as a result. Let's go back to our story here. Flip back over to Genesis chapter 16. It's just interesting how, how people knew that for a long time, that God's the one. God's the one that prevented. God's the one that prevented Sarah from bearing children. She said that herself. Think about how bad of a sin that is for her just to say, I know that God is preventing me from having this child yet I still want one, so let's do it a different way. That's wickedness. That's a sin. It's, it, she, needs to, she should have just had faith in the Lord and trusted His timing. And the repercussions of this sin is, is immense. This goes on and on for a long time. But let's keep reading. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now it says here that, um, you know, it brings up the fact a couple times that Hagar was an Egyptian. Now, I don't think... I think the reason why that even matters at all is because all throughout the Bible, you see, Egypt is always referred to as a place of the heathen. It's a, like an anti-Christ, an anti-God place. And we're seeing just one more thing that comes out of Egypt. You know, they're basically going to the world and using the world's method. Egypt is synonymous with, with going to the world and, and Satan's plans and Satan's devices. And, and it's real symbolic all throughout the Bible. So it mentions here twice in, in Genesis 16, that uh, Hagar was an Egyptian. And I think it's just pointing that out that, um, that it, you know, this is, this is the way that the world thinks. Girls, stop right now. And it says here that Abram, that she gave her to Abram to be his wife. Now, when you read the rest of the, you know, the rest of the scriptures regarding Abraham, it seems like she's more his concubine than anything else, not like his, a legitimate wife. But regardless, she was given to him to be his wife. And people will say, oh, yeah, especially like the Mormons. They want to defend the polygamy. And, they, you know, I talk to these people and they'll say, well, we don't do that now. We don't believe in that. But even though they used to, even though Joseph Smith and their founders, you know, they all believed in this stuff. And other people, too. It's not just the Mormons who want to believe in this, that polygamy is okay. It's fine. They'll always point to like, oh, well, Abram had multiple wives or, you know, Jacob had multiple wives. Now, we have to understand that, first of all, just because a person does something in the Bible, it doesn't mean that that's right and that that's okay. I mean, there's people in the, in the Bible that killed other people. That doesn't mean it's right. There's all kinds of horrible things of stories that people did in the Bible. Even righteous men did some really bad things. You're going to tell me that because David committed adultery and, and had Uriah the Hittite killed, that that's okay. Well, David did it, right? So it must be fine. No, that's stupidity. Of course it's not fine. It was completely, it was, it was completely sinful. And God always seems to point out, no matter who the person is in the Bible, He always points out at least one of their sins so that we don't lift any person up to a point of idolatry where we start to worship somebody other than Jesus Christ because He's pointing out, look, you're all sinners. 
Even David, who is considered a man after God's own heart, committed some pretty wicked sins. Okay? None of us can attain that level of perfection like God has or Jesus has. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we get to see people's sins in the Bible, that why we're even told about it, is so that we don't elevate anybody above that they, they ought to be elevated to. And, um, but what we see in the Bible as well is that just because someone does something, yeah, it doesn't make it right. But look at all of the examples of polygamy in the Bible. And we're not going to turn to them all, but just think about the stories. Okay, how well did this turn out for Abraham and Sarai? Doesn't seem to turn out very well because right away, as soon as she conceived, Sarai is despised. Hagar despises her. There's, it causes this contention. You have multiple wives. That's not God's plan. It's leave father and mother and cleave unto your wife, not wives, wife. And you become one flesh with one other person. You're not becoming one flesh with, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. But um, who else had multiple wives? Jacob had multiple wives, right? Israel. Jacob had, had his, his 12 sons and, and through different wives. He had uh, Rachel and Leah, and then their, their, uh, their maids, right? And how well did that turn out? I mean, remember the stories where, where Rachel and Leah were always in, in strife and in contention and, and, and um, you know, competing with one another. And Leah's like, well, God's blessed me. And, got, you know, and, and, and Rachel's like, oh, okay, well, I'm not having children, so I'll give you my handmaid, and I'll have children you know, the same way that, that Abram and Sarai were doing. And um, there's just a lot of fighting, a lot of contention going on. David had multiple wives. And look at his life with women in general. He committed adultery. And he ended up putting away Michael. You remember after he came back and Michael was delivered unto him again, when, when, um, after he had fled from Saul and she was given another man's, to be another man's wife, and then he came back to, to claim the kingdom and she was given back to him. When he came back from a battle, he was dancing and, you know, and Michael said something and was kind of jealous, like, oh, well, you know, what are you doing dancing? And, and he put her away. And it's because he was you know, around these other women. But again, more contention. And it says that she didn't have any children and because he put her away. And then even with Absalom going in unto his concubines, right, and in, in, in daylight. Right? They put up a tent on top of the house and, and he went into all of his concubines. Not a very good example of polygamy either. How about Solomon? Talk about the ultimate example of polygamy, the man who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. His heart, they turned his heart away from the Lord. By the end of his life, he was building altars under these false gods and stuff because his wives wanted them. And there is no good example. You cannot find me one positive example of polygamy in the Bible. It always brings contention. It always brings strife. It always brings problems. It's not God's plan. It was never okay. It's always marriage between a man and a woman. And this is the debate we should be having today is like, well, could you have multiple wives or just one as opposed to like two men getting married? I mean, how perverted is that? When, when now we have to just have these arguments over, should we allow you know, men to get married with men? What? You don't even need the Bible to tell you that that's weird and wrong and perverted. I can understand this. That is beyond comprehension. But just because people do things in the Bible doesn't always make it right. Let's, um, are you still in Genesis 16? Let's continue reading here. So we, were, uh, we just read verse number 4. So, so now that uh, Hagar is despising Sarai in, in, in her eyes because she was able to have a child, you know, now she's all lifted up and thinking, oh, well, you know, God's blessing me. I'm having Abram's son. You know, like she's less of a person because she wasn't able to conceive. Now she's having a child. You can see where this goes. Right? You can see where she's just despising her eyes now. And she says, oh, Abram's going to love me more now because I'm having his, his child. And you can't do that. You're less of a person. You're inferior. You've got something wrong with you. And this is, this is the way it plays out. And they go into it thinking, yeah, this is a great idea. We'll have a child and stuff. No. And just a thought, I mean, I, I can't even comprehend how Sarah, Sarah would just be like, 
you're going unto this person and have that type of relationship that he should have only had with her. Now, go ahead and do this with somebody else. It's wickedness. Shouldn't even be a thought. Let's keep reading. Verse number five. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Abram's like, Look, you're my wife. You know, deal with her how you need to deal with her. It's fine with me. You know, like, like he's not... He's trying to tell her, like, I'm not going to just, just cleave unto her now. He's like, you need to deal with her. If she's despised in your eyes, then, then you can deal with the situation. And it's completely fine with me. So she deals hardly with her, you know. And, and um, because there is that, that relationship they have, if you will, she's the maid. I mean, she's the servant. She's there to, to serve them. She's the employee, if you will. She's their servant. And, um, and Sarai and Abram are, are her bosses. And now there's this lack of respect for Sarai in Hagar's eyes. So Sarai deals with it. She deals hardly with her and, and then makes Hagar to, to flee away from her. Verse number seven, it says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain, found Hagar, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence came us out. And this is interesting too because he doesn't just say, Hagar, where'd you come from? Whence came us out? He says, Hagar, Sarai's maid. He starts off just making the point like, this is your position. You're, you're her maid. This is your role. And then he said, now gently, but still saying, hey guy, Sarai's maid. Just kind of like the Bible says in the lineage, um, I think it's in Matthew, when it's going through the lineage of Joseph, and it says that um, when it goes through David, it says from her that, it, that was the wife of Urias about Bathsheba and just, just pointing out that, that that was Uriah's wife. Just like um, it, it, there's a few other places it does the same thing. But it's making that point. And, he, and he's saying here, you know, your Sarai is made. Whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. So he tells her what her, what her job is, according to, to God's messenger, according to the angel of the Lord. She needs to go back and humble herself and submit herself and put herself back into that role of her servant. Even though this whole thing happened, the right thing for her to do was to be in the role that she was in. Now turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter number 3. Actually, go to Ephesians 6. I like Ephesians 6 a little bit. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 6, or Ephesians 5 and 6 and Colossians 3 are, are parallel passages. Um, I've got them both here, but they basically say the same thing. I like the way Ephesians 6 says it a little bit better. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 5. We're going to see a little bit about, about being a servant, right? Uh, Hagar was a maid, and her job was to her boss, to her bosses. She had a specific role to fill. And the Bible lays out authority figures in our life that we ought to be reverent and obedient unto. And we shouldn't have a rebellious heart. Now, whether it be a wife to her husband as the authority of the husband, whether it be um, a servant to their master as that authority figure, or even with the government. Okay. Now, again, they all have their realms. They all have their areas of authority. And if anyone tries to overreach their authority, then you don't have to recognize the overreach. You have that just, you know, so if the, when the government's overreaching its authority, that authority isn't coming from God. You have to obey the, the uh, authority that God has given to the government. When it's the same thing with the husband and wife, you know, God has given a specific authority unto his wife, but like, I'm a husband of my wife. I don't have authority over your wife, right? I have authority over my wife. I can't overreach and overset my body. You don't have to listen to anything from, as, from a husband wife perspective from someone who's not your husband, right? Um, and other things, you know, if I were to tell my wife to do something that's just against God and against her commandments, she could ignore that. And it's completely fine because she's obeying God's authority, not mine. Um, 
anyway, so we have this structure. We have this authority structure. And we ought not to be rebellious to any of it. So we're going to look a little bit now because, it, because we see this in the story with Hagar that God's telling her, look, you need to go back and humble, be humble and, and go back to, to being your servant as you ought to be. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So what he's explaining here, and this could be really um, applicable if you have a job. Because you are a servant. If you're working for someone, you are their servant. You are serving them. Yes, they're giving you a paycheck, but they're the boss and you're the employee. And it's important. If you want to have any type of success in the, in the workplace, you should listen up and take this advice. To have a humble heart. Don't Because a lot of people think, well, I know. Wait, what does he know? You know, they have this attitude towards their bosses, towards their managers, towards their whatever. So there's people who are put in charge of them. And just have this type of haughty attitude. Say, well, I know way more than they do. And I'm not going to listen to what he says because he's stupid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I know better. I'm going to do it this way. And they have this type of attitude. You know what? That person doesn't last very long on the job. They don't last. And it doesn't even matter if you do know things better. When you are in a position of being the servant, you need to be the servant. And God will see what you're doing and bless you, and bless you for it. He says... Servants obey in all things, your masters according to the flesh. And he says, don't do it with eye service. And this is the people who, you know, they're only going to, you're only going to find them working real hard when the manager's around. When the supervisor's around, it's like, oh man, where's the hammer? You know, like looking real busy just because someone's watching you. He's saying, that's, that's a man. Please. It's just in, in the eyes of man, he's saying, you don't do that. Because that's just a show anyway. This is a front. You ought to be a hard worker because you're a hard worker. You ought to be doing your job because it's your job. And he says the way you ought to be doing it, he says, don't worry, don't do it for that man. If you have it in your mind, like, because you could be working for someone who's an idiot. You could be. And, and when you think like, well, I'm just going to work for this person, the motivation may not be there. But he says, in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. He's saying when you do your work at your job, you should do it like you're working for God. If you're working for the Lord, hey, you want to please God, right? God's not an idiot. God's not someone you can look at and say, oh man, why should I work for him? God will see the work that you do. And if you have that type of a heart and that type of an attitude, you will excel at your job. God will bless you for that. People will see that. And it, you don't have to, you don't even, they don't even have to know that it's because you're serving the Lord. They're just going to see, hey, here's someone who's a hard worker. Here's someone who's getting the work done. Here's someone that I don't have to be monitoring all the time just to make sure they pick up their tools and do some work. Because they're not doing it just to be a man pleaser. They're doing it because it's their duty. They're doing it because it's their job. He says, but not with eye service as men pleasers, but the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord, not to men. Knowing, verse 8, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he, shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. So he's saying, look, God will reward you. He's saying, you're working unto God. If you're going to have that type of a heart and that type of attitude, you're going to do your job, God will reward you for that. And he says also, if you're a master, if you're, if you're the boss, if you're someone in charge, hey, take, that's right, treat your employees well. You do what's right to them. And he says, forbearing threatening. You don't have to threaten them because you know that you're ma you have a master. You're not at the top of the chain. You may be in your company, but you're not at the top of the chain. God's at the top. You have a master over you, and it says, neither is the respect of persons with him. God doesn't respect you just because you're the boss. You are at the same level as everyone else in his eyes. So he says, you treat people well, you treat them with respect, you treat them, now you're the boss, you tell them what to do, but you still don't treat them poorly. 
You know, and that, and that's so. So, regardless of if you're a servant or if you're the master at your job, take heed to this. This is good advice. Titus chapter two um, says a similar thing about being obedient to your masters. Titus chapter two verse number nine says, "Exhort servants." This is, and this is this is an exhortation to Titus on how to teach, how to, how to be a good preacher of God's word in the church. It's a, it's an epistle unto Titus from the apostle Paul on how things should be run in the church. He says in verse number nine of Titus two, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. He's saying to don't answer them again. Don't talk back. Don't, don't say like, you know, just question everything that your boss says. He says you just do it. He says not answering and not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity, right? You're being faithful to that person. You're not going around and, and, and talking to all of his context and trying to get jobs with them and doing everything else. Look, maintain your fidelity to that person. That's who you're serving. That's who you're doing. It says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. When you do that, you are putting on, you're adorning the doctrine of God in all things. In all areas of your life, you should walk worthy of Christ. You should walk in a way that is, that is evidence of your faith. You ought not to be the person that's the, the slothful, lazy person on the job and someone says, oh yeah, I know that person, they're a Christian. And they start thinking that the lazy people are the Christians. No, you ought to be the hardest working person on your job. You ought to be the one that's, that's willing to do the most and that's willing to put in the time and does a good job and say, yeah, and that person's also a Christian. Because the two should be going hand in hand. And having integrity and not being dishonest. All of these things, the way that you carry yourself is all representative of your faith in Christ if you're born again. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 16. So we saw that, that Hagar was told, go back, okay? Don't, you know, she was wrong to be despising her boss and her eyes. She shouldn't have been doing that. I mean, the whole situation was screwed. But you see what happens. They have this one sin, and then it just have, start having problem after problem after problem. You have all of these unexpected consequences of, as a result of that one covetous sin of wanting to have children outside of God's planning and His time. It's a snowball effect. And we're gonna, when we finish up, we're going to see the, the actual extent of that sin with Ishmael. But... Um, Let's keep reading here in verse number 10. It says, so, you know, she says, you have to submit yourself. But verse number 10 says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. So she gets a blessing, uh, you know, as well, that, that she was going to be blessed with, with many children. And it says in verse 11, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, um, if you want, you can turn to Galatians chapter 4. I'm just looking at the time. I'm going to cover this a little bit when we get to Genesis 21, probably a little bit more detail, but I want you just to see this because... Um, Galatians 4 really goes in depth about talking about Isaac being the, the son of promise and that um, Ishmael was the, was the seed of, you know, the seed of the bondwoman is, is basically representative of workspace salvation versus the seed of promise that comes through Isaac. But um, we're going to see here, I just want to point out one verse, verse number 25 of Galatians 4. It says, for this Agar, it's the same, it's Hagar. Um, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. And the only reason I'm pointing out that verse is because the seed of Ishmael that came from Agar here, from, from Abram and Agar, it says it's Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's, he was basically the progenitor of like the Arabians. And think about that seed 
And he was going to dwell among his brethren. There's been conflict and strife between Isaac and Ishmael, you know, their whole nations and everyone that is that has come as a result of that one sin. I mean, there's problems in the Middle East that have been around like forever, right? I mean, there's always if there's one area where there's war going on, it's always in the Middle East. It's always going on there. This strife, this conflict is not new, and the United States isn't going to solve it, but um, this has been going on forever. It goes way deeper, and you could trace it back, I believe, literally all the way back to this one, this one sin where Abram went in unto Hagar. Because if he didn't do that, there would be no Ishmael you know, and all this other stuff. Now, I mean, who, who, who's to say what the world would be like without that? But it can be traced back to that. And, and when it says that, that he's going to be a wild man, his hand is going to be against every man and every man's hand against him, that's just, we can see that strife even today. Even today, it's just, there's all this war, all this, and it says he's going to dwell in the presence of all his brethren, meaning, you know, Abraham, Isaac's children, right? They're going to dwell together. Um, but have these problems. And these problems even go back, um, you know, in the, in the Muslim faith as well. Because they trace back through to Ishmael. And Ishmael had 12 sons. And it's, you know, you have these, these similarities and confusion. And strife and problems. And it's all the result that you... Was Sarah and Abraham thinking that all of that was going to happen as a result of that one thing? No. Their eyes were on, we want to have a child. And they were so focused on that one thing. And because they were willing to go outside of God's plan for it, huge snowball effect of problems. And we need to keep this, you know, understanding when you're confronted with your desires and you have an option to sin against God, you may think, not that big of a deal. We'll just do this one thing, this one time, we'll have this child and we'll go back to serving God. That's what they were thinking. And you think the same things, I'll just, I'll just go out this one time and I'll get drunk and you know, whatever, we'll have, I'll probably will drink and, that, and that's it and then I'll just go back the next day and I won't touch it again or I'll just do this one, whatever it may be. I want to do this one thing, I'm just going to do it this one time. It's never going to work out the way that you think. There is always unintended consequences. It's always going to bring you further and deeper and plague you more than you ever thought possible. Yes. You have to stop it in advance and just, and just stay strong and stay faithful unto the Lord. Let's keep reading. We'll finish out the chapter. Uh, Galatians, or Genesis 16. I'm not, I'm not going to cover... I'm just gonna I'm gonna save the rest of that whole application of, of Galatians 4. I have it in my notes. I was gonna go through it if we had time, but I think I'm gonna do that uh, more in depth when we get to Genesis chapter 21. But let's keep reading here. Verse number. Uh, 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, I have I also there here looked after him that seeth me. Wherefore the well was called Beerle Hiroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. And uh, we see here that you know, Hagar was the one that was told to call his name Ishmael. Obviously, she had a conversation with Abram about it because it says then Abram called his name Ishmael. So she must have told Abram all about it, um, the angel of the Lord coming unto her and telling her that, look, this is going to be his name. His name is going to be Ishmael, and um, he's going to be blessed also. And it is. She, she does receive a blessing. It says in verse 10, you know, and the angel of the Lord sent unto her, uh, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. So she's promised to have, um, you know, quite the, um, the, you know, the, the children being being the progenitor of, of all these children. And um, even Abraham still has has a lot of feelings towards his son Ishmael in chapter 17, 
we see him pleading with God um, to, to bless his son Ishmael. And in verse number 20, it says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Twelve princes, not just twelve, twelve sons. Twelve princes are, princes are like principal people, like leaders of, of nations themselves. You're going to have twelve princes, just like Israel had, had twelve princes because they had twelve tribes, right? Um, and they, were, they were heads of their households. And um, he does the same thing here for Ishmael. Still, I believe, because, because Abraham was God's friend. And, um, and he still chose to bless him. And um, even out of the worst situations, you know, when you, when you make these bad sins, there's still always forgiveness. And you still come back to God. You know, God wasn't done with Abram just because he committed a sin. Now, Obviously, there's a lot of repercussions for that, and he, was, he had to reap what he sowed. But with a repentant heart, with a right heart, you know, God's still not done with you. God continued to use Abram well into his hundreds. And, um, you know, Abram was a great man, but we still we get to see, this. for as great as Abraham was, we see a blemish on his character as well. Every man of the Bible, you go through, you will find a blemish in their character. You'll see something that they've done wrong. And um, even the greatest men. So don't let yourself get discouraged if you've done something wrong or if you, in the future you do something wrong you know, and think that God's just completely done with you and He can't use you anymore because He can just make sure you get yourself right with God. I mean, if something's done and it's over with, okay, it's done. You, know, you have to be able to just, just repent, put it behind you, and say, I'm going to move forward this way. The best thing is to not let it happen in the first place, but we know that we're not perfect. So when it does, don't let Satan deceive you and get you out of church and make you think, oh, well, God can't use me. We, talk, we had a perfect example. We talked to a gentleman today out soul winning, and um, he was an older man. He was, he was a veteran of the Vietnam War. And one of the things that I believe is preventing him from getting saved is that he had done some things that he says, I don't think I can be forgiven. Now, I do believe there are sins you can do that are unforgivable, like the Bible spells out, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about things that happened in the war, and he was saying, you know, I got paid to do these things. It was my job. He says, but everybody's got a choice. He says he still did it. He is basically, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not saying, quoting him verbatim, but that's the gist of what he was saying is that, you know, I made this decision to do this. And he feels like he's done things that he just can't be forgiven for. So he wasn't even quite as interested in hearing about salvation because he thought it was already too late for him. And he's telling me, he's like, are these your girls? You had the invitation? He's like, don't waste your time on an old man like me. He says, make sure that, that you save them. And it's sad. But he got to that point to where he thinks God's done with him. But look, don't let yourself get to that point. It's good. I mean, you recognize what you've done. That's wrong. And it can be egregious. It could be a very serious sin in your life. And I'm not saying not to mourn or not to be sad about it. But you have to not let that count you out. And especially in this man's case, don't let that keep you out of heaven. Nobody wants to spend an eternity of hell. And I mean, if he, if he fully comprehended and realized how bad, because I don't think he really believed that hell is like a real bad place. He even said that when, when he asked Brother Sebastian um, what, you know, kind of what we believe. And, and Sebastian gave him a great definition of a hell about torture and torment and fire and all this stuff. And he was like, wow. He's like, he didn't think it was that bad. It is. And you don't want to go there. And you know, unfortunately today he didn't, he didn't put his faith in Christ, but hopefully one day he will. But don't let yourself get to that point to where you think God's done with you. Because you can always come back to him. And if you're still alive and you're still breathing, then God's got a plan for your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this chapter, dear God, for, for the entire Bible and for loving us so much that you've given us a free gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would please help us to, um, 
to live out our faith and to live out what we believe, to be good servants. If, if we've got bosses at work or if we are a boss, dear Lord, that we treat our servants well, dear God, I pray that you would please help us in, in whatever um, role we find ourselves in, that we would be pleasing to you, that we can obey your commandments and live a righteous, in a righteous way that will be pleasing to you. And also, dear Lord, help us to, to not have this attitude that children are, are a burden or a bad thing, dear God, but they truly are a blessing and that you'll take care of us. Help us as your people to be, you know, even though we may be very different from the world, which we are called out to be a peculiar people, dear Lord, help us to do that and not to be brainwashed or influenced by the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness, but that we would just turn to your words, turn to your understanding, and just have faith and accept it as, as being straight from you, and that we would use these, um, use your words when making the decisions that are important in our life, dear Lord. We love you, and it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to one last song before we're dismissed.